So welcome everyone. I'm Hannah from the Blue Hill Library and I just wanted to say a quick hello and thank you all for joining us this evening. We're very excited tonight. This is the first installment of the library's Slavin lecture series for the year. Um, the Robert K and Linda B Slavin lecture series is supported by a generous donation from the Anahata Foundation. And this year, our theme for the series that we've chosen is the world beyond us. So um, look out for more programming coming up soon on that theme. You know, tonight we're going deep under the ocean. We might be going into space or down into the microscopic world. And we've got lots of ideas that are in the works. So stay tuned for more programs on that theme, hopefully soon. But yes, tonight we are thrilled to have Dr. Carly Weiner from the Schmidt Ocean Institute with us. And she's going to share a presentation about the uh, deep sea discoveries that they have made exploring the unexplored. I think we're going to see some great uh, images and videos of some pretty impressive stuff. Um, you're welcome to put your questions in the chat as we go. And then we'll also have some time for Q&A at the end. So if you have a question that strikes you as we go along, type it out in the chat and I'll read those out at the end. And like I said, we'll have time at the end as well for folks to speak up. So Carly, without further ado, I will hand it over to you. Show us some cool stuff. Well, I hope I will be. Thank you so much, Hannah. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you all for sharing your Wednesday evening with me. Um, really looking forward to talking a little bit more about Schmidt Ocean Institute, the work that we do, and sharing the world beyond us. Because, you know, everyone gets excited about space. We get excited about the ocean and the deep sea, which is like our inner space. There's so much we still don't know and are still discovering. And I hope you will discover something new uh, this evening. So without further ado, I'm gonna share my screen. Hopefully this is gonna work. Um, we can uh, be flexible here. And if you have a dying question or burning question in between some of these slides, just feel free to speak up. I'm gonna present pretty casually on this today. Um, I'm going to start by everyone, can you see my screen okay? Okay, great. So we'll start with Schmidt Ocean Institute, um, and the Institute has been around since 2009. We are a nonprofit that has been generously founded by Eric and Wendy Schmidt, who had a goal to really um, characterize the ocean using cutting edge science, openly sharing it, and making data available to the public. And that is exactly what we do. We have our research vessel Falcor, which was purchased in 2009. We spent three years refitting the ship, and um, in 2012, we started doing science with the vessel. I'm pleased to share that we have announced this year, we just purchased a new vessel, Falcor 2, which will come online um, sort of mid-year mid in 2022. So we are expanding our capabilities and what we offer scientists in um, able to really understand the deep sea. Uh, we sail Falcor all over the world to do cutting edge science using technology and we work with scientists at many institutions internationally. We have an artist program and a student program, um, and we openly share all of the information we collect. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on in this talk. So I wanted to start with some of the incredible imagery that we have been able to collect with Sebastian, our deep diving robot. This is a 4,500 meter ROV or remotely operated vehicle that we use to collect imagery and samples of unique frontier systems that are very hard and hard to get to places. We go all over the world and we've discovered many new species with the incredible 4K cameras that we've seen. Not only are we able to see new species, but also explore some of these unique organisms as well as seafloor features. The backdrop of movies and superstitions, the deep sea has always been infamous because we really don't know what, if anything, existed in this pressure filled environment. We can now say confidently that this is not a barren area. And as you can see by some of this imagery, it is thriving with life, unique life that is developed and adapted to these cold pressure filled temperatures. And we are able to not only share this through the science and through the imagery we have, but also through unique programs like our Artist at Sea. These discoveries that we've been able to make exploring these systems have also allowed us to map more than 1.2 million square kilometers of seafloor and resolution never been, that's never been seen. 
We have undercovered new hydrothermal vent fields, different species, and have had a better understanding of how this deep sea biodiversity interacts with each other and how it influences nearby systems. This is not only important for our general knowledge, but also for in how people manage these areas and how we protect them and better understand them for the future. Schmidt Ocean Institute has conducted more than 1500 science days in the last five years to doing this work, traveled around a, a distance of about 10 times around the world and bringing 936 scientists from more than 30 countries. We couldn't be more proud of the work that we've done and with these new insights, being able to share 3D scanning reconstruction, delicate samples and uh, sorry, fragmented meteorites that we've collected with technology that allows us to better understand and characterize the deep sea system. SOI's most exciting discovery has taken place in the last year through our work in Australia. And today I'm gonna to talk about this geographic campaign where we'd been working in Australia's deep ocean from January of last year to present day. We literally just yesterday finished our last day of exploration in Australia and we'll be moving on to other places. Now, what we do is science-based exploration. So it allows us to not only look for unique organisms and seafloor features, but to really understand and document what is there. Documenting biodiversity and fossil records is critically important for understanding this deep sea environment. And like I mentioned earlier, how we manage it. ROV sampling is probably our most exact approach for understanding the deep sea. And in fact, is a uh, very conscientious way to look at ocean organisms. Prior to ROV technology, a lot of people would trawl the deep sea floor with large nets and just pick up whatever they were able to, characterize, to get to characterize what was found in the deep sea. This allows us to have a much more precise targeted sampling method so that we are not destroying an entire ecosystem, but really understanding what's there, what's thriving there, and using genetics to determine what's new. And that is a really key piece of the sampling program that we have. We collect specimens, ge geologic samples, chemical samples that provide an important baseline to be able to compare future changes in species health and distribution, environmental insights, and even give us uh, a look into the past to understand what was there and help us with present day and future modeling. Now I mentioned we have a robotic vehicle. This is Sebastian, our ROV. It's about the size of a small minivan or small bus and can go down and explore the ocean to 4,500 meters. Australia has no deep sea underwater robot system dedicated to science exploration. And so what makes this campaign very rare is that we've been able to touch waters that haven't been seen before. So a lot of the dives we've been doing have been looking at systems and waters that haven't been looked at before. The dives that we do are live streamed, which means as we are diving in real time, that's going to the Schmidt Ocean Institute Facebook and YouTube page. And why this is important is it allows everybody to participate. I was so pleased to hear um, before we started the lecture today, Rebecca, um, who I'm assuming was, is an educator, was talking about her students watching the stream. This is exactly what we want. We have uh, a huge following of people that will follow along with our dives and actually are very very helpful in providing content and um, information. You know, hey, you missed that. Can you go back over there? Or a lot of scientists from all over the world who are now contributing to these dives to say, I've never seen that before. That's a new species record, or that's a broader distribution than ever been, that's ever been seen. And have that actually helped us do this collective science to identify new species. And the dives are shared in perpetuity. So if you miss one, you can go back at any time. And in fact, they're cataloged by expeditions so that these can remain as data sources for anyone who's interested in looking at them. It also allows the public to experience the excitement and the motion that the scientists have. I mean, their reactions are amazing, especially when they find new species or something really different. For example, on this last expedition we just completed, 
um, the Ashmore Reef Marine Park, which is sort of the northwestern side of Australia, um, they discovered a sea snake, uh, which is really unique because it was thought to be locally extinct in this region. And they were so fascinated by the sea snake. Um, so really being able to have this collective science taking place around the world and sharing enthusiasm about science and discovery is a really positive thing that we feel we bring to the public. Now, um, of course, this past year has changed everything for every single person on this planet. Um, and it has been a challenging time for everyone and for us in marine operations, especially. However, we've been really fortunate enough to be able to continue operating our vessel and our science during the pandemic, partly because we were already at sea when the pandemic took hold, but also because we were in Australia, which didn't have a lot of cases. And we also have technology on board that allowed uh, for our scientists to participate remotely. And so we had two expeditions this year where we had no science party coming on board, but we're conducting the whole thing from their living room. And so this new mode of operation is really, really um, bringing understanding and capabilities to the entire world that we haven't been able to do. Falkor is really unique. And in that last slide, you saw Dr. Robin Beeman from James Cook University leading an expedition from his bedroom, literally being able to tell us where to go, watching the mapping, watching the diving, um, sharing with us what needed to be sampling. We were Falcor's first fully remote science team. None of the science team could actually be on board the ship. This came about uh, sort of in an interesting way because of COVID-19. We had to figure out how to be able to communicate with the ship regularly. But what really surprised me was, you know, that, that actually turned to an, into a real advantage, the fact that so many scientists around the world were, were in lockdown. We went to the Queensland Plateau, a large plateau out in the Coral Sea Marine Park. It's one of the largest marine reserves on Earth. And so the aim of the expedition was, number one, to do a whole lot of multi-beam mapping to understand the, the very detailed shape of the seafloor. The multi-beam maps are really a very, very crucial first step in understanding um, the geologic evolution of these systems. And this gives us more information about how ice sheets have behaved in the past, how stable or unstable they might be in the future uh, in response to um, global warming. Because of course in the ocean nothing happens in isolation. Everything is connected both horizontally and vertically. So now having this extra layer of knowledge is going to be incredibly useful for any future management. Remote sensing technologies like uh, multi-beam sonar, that's great in itself, but it's another thing to actually put a camera there, and especially something as good as the Sebastian, where I do feel like I'm, I'm there on the seafloor. One of my favourite memories, my first dive, uh, a big squid swam across the screen, and I was like, oh, this is a good start. And we came upon this red blob, and it was a sea cucumber. It flew up and used its tentacles to fly around and to, to swim away. It's just been exciting and I've got no other work done during this time because I've spent my days glued to the screen and waiting to see what would come up next. Probably one of the most uh, standout for me is just the number of chambered Nautilus that we've seen. I stop for Nautilus. You know, they say stop for rainbows, I, say, I stop for Nautilus. There were quite a few species that we didn't expect would occur here. So we call that range extensions when we see something that we know occurs somewhere else, but we've never seen it here before. The chats, that's been fascinating, right? Suddenly I'm out there with a hundred experts. For everybody, it was just a really interesting experience. I think it's something that you know, really should be a, a model of, of how to do this type of science um, in the future. Patrick, he's from Belgium, and he's a slit snail expert. Like, I don't even know what a slit snail is, but he's just said, you've just found the first slit snail in the Coral Sea. You know, he's over the moon. There were 
things that I've never seen before. Geomorphic features, I have no clue what they are. Good morning, everybody, and we are now live. What is most appealing about your work at the For me, it has to be the people and uh, being able to facilitate uh, their endeavors to peel back what we don't know of the ocean floor is pretty rewarding. Everything in the world that's alive is basically forms a tapestry that ultimately holds us. And I think it's important to think about that because every time you lose something, you lose a thread out of the tapestry that ultimately supports us humans. The research vessel Falcor was one of the few research ships in the world that were able to operate through this crisis. And I, I think the Schmidt Ocean Institute have, have set a very, very high bar. This is the bar we need to work to, towards in the future. I guess the big message there is that the science must continue. So as you can see, um, we were still able to get quite a bit done despite the pandemic. And Australia campaign took us to both the Western and Eastern sides. Um, of the continent. There are 1,700 species of coral and 4,000 types of fish alone, and our shared priority was to take a look deeper than 200 meters below the surface. And this is why we committed over a year-long campaign to Australia. We committed multiple expeditions throughout the year, seven in 2020 and four in 2021, which allowed us to be able to explore multiple different types of regions and science from protected areas, both on the eastern and western side. I'll talk a little bit about some of the highlight discoveries from last year that we felt were really exciting for us. In January, we partnered with the University of Western Australia and examined the south and west coasts. There in that expedition in the Bremer Canyon Marine Park, we were able to make multiple discoveries, including um, this area was known as a biodiversity hotspot for marine species such as, whale, you know, larger species, whales, dolphins, but we had no idea what the deep sea would hold and we found incredible coral gardens, um, associated fauna and geologic samples that were just incredible for us and including the first whale fall that they found in that area. Um, on the southern ocean side of the Bremer Canyon, we found also important information by looking at coral samples to archive the past, which I mentioned was something that scientists do to understand and model for the future. Well, the scientists on board this particular expedition were looking at past climate changes and ocean conditions in this region, as well as global scale events. Because the Southern Ocean is completely encircling Antarctica, it is the main driver uh, for global climate and helps to regulate the supply of heat and nutrient rich waters to most of the major oceans. So this was an important connection for this specific area that we were looking um, and making that connection between sites across the Southern Ocean and help scientists trace some of these water masses that um, disperse up towards the Indian Ocean and northward towards Australia. On the next expedition, we hand, uh, headed to the Ningaloo Canyons. And this is also an area of incredible biodiversity. And we focused on the Cape Range Canyons off Ningaloo. And this allowed scientists to explore, again, undocumented depths that were filled with octopus and glass sponges and squid that were seen for the first time in the Western Australia region. Now, this was one of our most incredible expeditions where we were able to find, to date, the world's longest sea creature. So this is a uh, siphonophore. It was measured at 150 feet on just the outer ring alone. Um, and so this was a huge discovery for us. We are very, very excited. For those of you who don't know what a siphonophore is, it's sort of a colony of self-replicating individual zooids, sorry, that clone themselves and continue to make this large structure and it looked like something out of the twilight zone. We also found many new records of fish and marine invertebrates. Now why this is important is because it was a way to engage the public in science that otherwise wouldn't have gotten enough attention. And we were able to find that uh, the news of the world's longest species found in the deep ocean really resonated with people all over the world. Everyone was excited about this because it showed that you know, we still don't know a lot about our oceans. It was covered in 21 languages in 26 countries. If you can't 
if you're still finding 150 foot large organisms, what else is out there that we don't maybe know about? So that Safana 4 story was a big one for us and allowed us to really leverage some of the expedition work that we did. After completing four months of research on the West Coast, we headed over to Queensland to focus on the Great Barrier Reef and the Coral Sea Marine Park, which you heard Dr. Robin Beeman speak about in the film I just showed. Now, this area is one of the most iconic area, natural areas in the world, the Great Barrier Reef. I'm sure everybody here has heard of that. However, most people don't know that we still have a long way to go in understanding this area, particularly in the deeper systems, right? We know a lot about the shallow corals, but not much about some of these deep systems. And so this was our first virtual expedition that took place in, 20, uh, in 2020, and we were still able to accomplish so much. As you can see in some of these images, we were able to look at all kinds of organisms, found um, a rare deep sea fish, uh, and many new range extensions for fish that were never thought to be in this area as well as new discoveries, including some new black coral species, sponges, and jellyfish. The extraordinary mapping that took place in this deep area on the Queensland Plateau was also very important. We illuminated a complex seafloor of 30 large corals, atolls, and banks, and revealed submarine canyons, dune fields, and submerged reefs. More than 78,000 square kilometers were mapped, which is an area about uh, the si half the size of Tasmania. And we transformed this Queensland Plateau, which was once the poorest area mapped in the seafloor in Australia, to one of the best mapped areas. And this is an actual map of the region that we looked at. And Falcor has capabilities to be able to use multi-beam mapping, so acoustic pinging, to map and visualize in three dimensions the seafloor. The maps that we created also are made publicly available. And this is really important because those maps will help create better information for scientists to understand what areas they want to study in the future. They're made publicly available through Oz Seabed, a national Australian seabed mapping program, as well as contributing to the Nippon Foundation Seabed 2030 project, which is a global uh, project to try and map the world seafloor by 2030. Recently, we've been able to make a lot of inroads in mapping more. I believe we were at 15%, maybe five years ago, of the seafloor, and I'm pleased to say we're at um, almost 19% of the seafloor mapped, which is a huge uh, stride or jump in areas in just a short amount of time. And we are pleased to also say that Seabed 2030 is an official partner of Schmidt Ocean. Thank you. We are really looking at ancient underwater landscapes. To understand the modern Great Barrier Reef, you have to actually look into the past and look at these ancient landscapes because this is the base upon which the Great Barrier Reef has grown. And nobody knew that this was here. This is the first time that we're seeing bathymetry images of the seafloor here in this region and then the ROV video to go with it so we can see what it actually looks like down there. To try and explain what we're seeing, if you imagine if you took the Grand Canyon and added on the Niagara Falls times two and then flooded that with seawater and stuck a coral reef on top, in some places we're really scratching our heads as to try and understand how do you explain this but certainly we're looking at something that is far far older than the actual great barrier reef itself now when we put the rov down to have a look what we are seeing are numerous i'm talking dozens and dozens of large drowned reefs we have to go back in the past to times where sea level was not at the same position that is now. We have weeds growing at sea level, very close to sea level, but the sea level rise, 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 and they finally get drawn. One thing that we see when, when a reef is drawn is the sequence of organisms that are living on that reef. It starts like with shallow water coral species. If sea level, rise a bit, that coral species are substituted by a bit deeper coral species. If sea level continues to rise, 
the biology change, we can more or less estimate the, the speed of the sea level change in the past. So we can compare if those sea level changes occur at the same speed that they are occurring now. So we can say if it's a natural process or it's an anthropogenic induced process. But living on and amongst all of this, this deep landscape are really quite amazing animals. The deeper we go, the weirder it gets. Almost everything we see is a new observation that's never been seen in this region before, or even a new species, an undescribed species, or even a genus. For me, it's very interesting to see how the community changes as the geology changes. Uh, so the geology dictates what type of habitat it is and therefore what type of community will colonise. Well, we try to understand because it helps us understand the Great Barrier itself. They are intimately joined. The shape of that ancient underwater landscape is related directly to how the Great Barrier Reef grows on it. And so what we're looking at is a really remarkable landscape. Like, I have never seen such an amazing seafloor. So hopefully, hopefully we've captivated you a little bit um, so far in what we found. And we thought we were doing pretty good with some incredible species. We found the world's largest, longest sea creature, but then we were even more surprised. And I could not believe on October 20th, what we discovered and scientists were doing some mapping and found a detached reef from the Great Barrier Reef. And while we knew that there was possible for surprises in this deep area, we had no idea that what we had discovered was a brand new coral reef. The first reef discovered in the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park in 120 years. And not only did we discover a new coral reef, we discovered a coral reef 500 meters tall. So you're looking at it right here. This is the actual mapping renderings. So picture a reef, very vertical, uh, 100, that hasn't been seen in 120 years or discovered nothing new in 120 years, taller than the Empire State Building, taller than the Eiffel Tower, taller than Auckland Sky Tower, and the tall, it was unbelievable. And what we were able to do is then through the maps and this discovery is go and dive on this newly discovered reef. And what we found was an incredibly diverse ecosystem at the shallow, shallow parts. There was anemones and clownfish and sharks. And as you got deeper, the organisms changed as was mentioned in the uh, previous video. Here's actually a screenshot from a sh fairly shallow on that new reef at 49 meters. And Dr. Robin Beeman and uh, from James Cook University and his science party were on board when they made the discovery. And the science team was able to conclude that this was the base of an ancient reef that was possibly 20 million years old. So at the top, you have this thriving ecosystem and at the bottom, you have this history that can share many, many years of evolution. And it just shows how much people want to be interested in the ocean. Um, you know, we had the Safana 4 discovery, which made its rounds. And then we had this, which led to 583 stories in 27 countries. So it's something we are very proud of. And we had a really good week. The next day, we also made this amazing discovery of the ram's horn squid. Now, this was the first time it had ever been seen alive on video before. And I can tell you all the squid biologists that followed us were extremely excited and is important because we would have overlooked this. We did not have the squid biologist on our staff or on board to know what we were looking at until all of a sudden scientists on Twitter started going crazy. And so this is the power in collective science. And I think it's just a really great example of how we can collaborate and work together. And that brings us to how we do our outreach at Schmidt Ocean Institute. Um, Wendy Schmidt, our founders, always said that our vision is to open up the oceans in new ways, whether you're a student, a scientist, a farmer, an artist, it doesn't matter what you do. We are all connected to the oceans. It is our life support system. And we take that approach in how we share publicly with what we do. And we try to make science and oceans exciting and bring it to people in their living rooms. 
Ocean Science is now available for public engagement. You can use this through data visualization, you can do arts, you can do technology. All these things make it possible for us now to encapsulate a broader understanding of what we have on our seafloor. And it allows us to leverage mass media with incredible images and engage public that wouldn't otherwise be engaged. And today I've shown two examples of this. Another unique program that we have is our Artist at Sea program. And this is a new program um, that hasn't really been done prior to 2015 when we started it. But um, we bring artists on board as part of the science party. They engage with the scientists, they participate in the science, they collect the data and gather a new understanding. And what this collaboration does is allows the artist to be inspired by the work and to translate what is being discovered to the public. And so this is a wonderful opportunity also for the science party and the scientists participating to think creatively about the work that they do. Um, the artists that have come on board have created works that have engaged the public who may be um, overwhelmed or intimidated by science, but have been able to embrace the work through the arts. Since 2016, we have had, actually this is outdated, 36 artists and have over 150 pieces of artwork in our collection. We've exhibited them in a traveling exhibit to 16 different city, 16 exhibits in 10 different cities and reached many people through our art program. Our artists that come on board not only participate in the science, but they engage in the communities that they work with live from the ship and through some of their, their work that they donate and the outreach that they do. I'd like to share some examples of the science of the Artist at Sea program that we have. And you'll see we brought on many different artists, so um, doing all kinds of things from sculpture to interpretive dance to painting to com music composing, all different types of artists have been in our program and translated in many different ways. We've welcomed all the, all the artists who have, a lot of them stayed in touch and been part of our family, uh, connecting their work to the deep sea long after they've left the, um, the uh, ship. We've had a cartoonist, Lucy Bellwood, who's created a multi-beam mapping comic book that we have now um, had three print runs as well and has been distributed to many classrooms around the world. Not only do we engage with artists, but we engage with students through our student opportunity program, bringing both college and undergraduate students who have never had an opportunity to go out to sea to engage in critical um, experiences that we hope will help shape their interest and future in science. We have multiple ways of engaging with students through the science, as I mentioned in the middle there is the comic book, but we've had artists create coloring books, we have our live diving, which you can always follow and get notifications on if you follow us at Schmidt Ocean. We have lesson plans based on the science that takes place at sea, as well as our status page. So you can actually see our sensors collecting data in real time and follow the ship. We also offer a lot of opportunities within the communities that we visit. So we have ship tours in pre and post COVID times where people can come on board and look at the vessel, look at the technology we have and how we collect the information that we do. We also try to create more of a humanistic perspective Yesterday of the we scientists. Were We've in the created right this program of called Science Stories. And I'll share and one example really quickly here. So you can see that, that well. there's a person behind the science and that these scientists and um, really do course. have exciting personalities and lives and and, and, and then suddenly J-Rod, one of the ROV pilots, spotted it. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was tiny and completely camouflaged and it took the rest of us a little while to spot it as well. Ah, uh, yeah, something's weird. Wait waving. a second, we got to pick a seahorse. Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah. 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 definitely. It was this little orange, yellow, slightly bumpy thing. And after a while, you could just make out its two black beady eyes. When we repositioned to get a better look, you could really see how it was attached to the coral and hanging on there and moving with the currents at that depth. Hmm, we're gonna try to catch its face. Here we go, here we go. Oh yeah, oh, perfect, well done. We've spent hours diving deep into these canyons and looking at these huge ecosystems and geological features. And it was 
just incredible to pause for a while and really appreciate the tiny parts of this system that are so important as well. This is one more example May I'll I just share really quickly. Moment this is Dr. Of Mandy Gray. And, that just, and um, this is the her adrenaline rush that you get when you see something for the first time. Lake in a one hour will be this is by far two kilometers my favorite moment in the deepest ever area. Had, and um, it's in just a different of all world. Our lives. It's just like science fiction, but it's the reality. Welcome to the live feed from ROV Sebastian, currently 2,000 meters below the Gulf of California. The possibility for discovery is so, so immense here. Okay, this is even trippier. Can you go down a little bit and get a better look up? Big old bag. Holy cow. What? <laughs> this so we feel by sharing the wonder of the ocean, using incredible imagery, new discovery, and also showing the personality and humanizing the scientists on board, we are able to engage new audiences and new people, not only in the science, but in a care and understanding for our oceans. So with that, I'd be happy to answer questions and I highly encourage everyone here today to please follow us on our journey through our website. Um, if you go to our annual reports, we have a beautiful interactive um, impact report from 2020 and all of these discoveries you can find there. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube at Schmidt Ocean, where you can be notified of the dives we do and our next steps. Our next expedition will take place beginning June 5th, all the way running through to July 7th, where we will be going from Honolulu, Hawaii to the Phoenix Islands protected areas. And I promise those dives will not disappoint. We will definitely discover some new species and see some incredible imagery. So thank you for sharing your Wednesday evening with me and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Carly. That was so cool. <laughs> Um, Hello. I have a question. Hannah, you're breaking up a little. So uh, let's take uh, the question here from seven already. Six number here. Okay. Hi, I'm Roger. Hi. Uh, Roger. I guess my wife brought it up while watching uh, it. And, oh. yeah. <laughs> Am I good? I think we had a couple. Go ahead. What's your question? Her. But the question is, uh, we learned something new you just showed about the sinking of the uh, um, of the coral reefs, which, which was interesting. Uh, but you didn't mention anything about the uh, acidification and bleaching of corals. I'm just wondering if that's a normal phenomenon or strictly an environmental current issue. Um, so I think it would be dependent on where you are in the world and what exactly you're looking at. That's not my area of expertise, so I don't want to say definitively yes or no. In a general I'm talking about coral in Australia in particular, the um, Great Coral but, Reef. Uh, we didn't look at acidification in Australia. We have had expeditions in the past where they have looked at acidifying and actually in Perth Canyon in Australia in 2015, they were looking at um, the impact of acidification in deeper sea corals. Um, you'll see that typically uh, more on shallower corals, they're more impacted by that, but um, there are impacts. And what the, the big issue is, is the additional carbon, which is acidic in the water, and that impacts um, the corals, which are very, very fragile and have, you know, a very small window of where, mm -hmm. you know, they find homeostasis or a comfort level. Um, I would encourage you to take a look at that 2015 expedition. You might um, find some interesting stuff from that cruise on our website. Okay. Any other questions I can answer live? I have a question. Um, hi, Kurt. Hi, how are you? Thank you for this presentation. It was really wonderful. You're doing amazing things. Uh, you know, it seems as though <clears throat> in conjunction with increasing deep sea exploration from a 
biological and geologic <coughs> perspective almost faster than that is happening. Uh, you read about deep sea mining and the destruction of, of these new habitats and new frontiers before anyone's able to even look at them. Can you speak to that a little bit? Sure, um, that's a great question, an extremely timely question, Kurt. Um, what I can say is that we still don't know a lot about the deep sea and about these ecosystems. And what we don't know is how well these ecosystems interact with each other. In fact, um, we did some work um, on, with Falcor in 2016, where the scientists were looking at um, hydrothermal vent systems that were close by to each other. And what they were finding is that there was genetic differentiation between each system within the same region. And so we just don't know yet how these systems interact with each other. So that if, you know, let's say you mine one system, is that going to come back? Will it be repopulated by other systems or all of these sort of distinct um, own populations, and we still don't have those answers. One of the things we're trying to do is really showcase that there is not a barren seafloor. In fact, it's filled with life. There's a lot there to look at. And so we are trying to tackle this issue, not through advocacy, but through science and better understanding and characterizing and at least getting a baseline of these deep sea systems. Sorry, I had a little issue of minute ago, but I know we had a question earlier from Sean about um, how is Falcor 2's mission going to differ from Falcor 1? Do you want to talk about that at all, Carly? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. And uh, it won't differ. So, um, you know, we are ship agnostic, as we'd like to say. Um, but what Falcor 2 will do is increase our capacity. So our berthing is limited for how many scientists we have on board in terms of Falcor 1 right now or Falcor Classic. On the new vessel, we'll be able to accommodate a lot more science, um, a lot more outreach. And so we'll just be able to do a lot more. Um, we will you know, upgrade the technologies as well at some point, And so be able to do more with the vessel than we can um, with Falcor Classic. Perfect. And Lita Beth wants to know, how do you select the projects you want to do and the scientists who get to use the ships? That's a great question. So um, typically we offer a um, call or expression of interest to scientists globally to submit um, a proposal to us. And then that will go through scientific review and we will work with our founders um, and our team to select the expeditions. And we're usually looking for expeditions that um, are not just your standard, you know, take some samples and call it a day science. We're looking for things that are a little more cutting edge, um, you know, frontier science that's in remote regions that people would not be able to get to otherwise, that engage an important societal topic as well, and that openly share their data. Um, COVID's thrown a little bit of a wrench into everything. <laughs> as I did mention, we were able to continue on with our science during 2020. Um, but we've had to delay and postpone some expeditions or shift our focus. Um, so we plan this year to be coming out with um, a, a more decadal plan around the work that we're doing, um, especially with the new ship. And um, with, plan with that will come new uh, plans for science. Super. And I see we had a question from Aaron who wants to know, is there a reason that the ram's horn squid hadn't been seen on video before? Is it super rare? So um, I can share a little bit about what I know about the ram's horn squid is that it's pretty common to wash up on the beaches in Australia. So people were very familiar with it, seeing it dead, not alive. Um, and in fact, they didn't know that it um, its movement was um, upside down, that it had been vertical. The way that we captured it on film was really rare to see, and they had not seen it alive before. So it wasn't that the species itself was rare, but catching it in the wild was. And, you know, it's very easy to do when you're looking in waters that haven't been looked at before, and you have these incredible 4K cameras that just um, bring life to everything that you're seeing. Nice. Um, another question from Lita Beth is, are there links on your website to the scientific papers that come out of these expeditions? There sure are. I'm glad you uh, asked that question. And in fact, what I can do is screen share um, for a moment here and take you through 
a little bit about uh, what our website looks like. Let's get this up here. Sorry, I have a bunch of things open. So if you look here, this is um, the impact report that I had mentioned earlier. So I don't think you... we're seeing it yet, Carly. It's just a black screen. Oh no. Okay, hold on. I'll try screen sharing one more time and seeing if that works. But if you go to schmidtocean.org, you'll be able to see um, not only each expedition that we do, if you go to each expedition page, it will show you the blogs, all the data and the papers related to it. So you can see this now. All right, so here is the 2020 impact report. You can get to it from our homepage. But some of the things that we're able to do is create interactives. And so you'll see on this um, page here that you can scroll through to get through some of the uh, highlights. And there's an interactive map animation that will allow you to kind of see the key discoveries that we made in Australia over the last year as it pertains to our cruise, where it was found on our cruise track lines, and it will jump through all the expeditions. But um, an easy way to access the data is if you know which expedition you wanna look at, you can go to cruises and each cruise page We'll have, um, for example, I'll just go to this Ice Age page, a cruise log, which will have blogs, collaborators, all the data publications related, all the news that's come out of the expedition, and a little bit about the team that has participated. You also get a map that you can zoom in on and look at all the data that has come off of there. Under RV Falcor, you can take a virtual tour. And you can also see our current status. So you'll be able to explore what we're doing in real time, see the maps and see the data that's been collected as well as the current status of ROV, ROV Sebastian. So you'll be able to see the tracks and all the sensor and information there. So lots to share. Um, I definitely encourage you to take a look at the website. Yeah, the website is great. I'll put in a plug for it. Um... If, if you guys haven't checked it out yet, if you liked seeing all these videos and great images and footage, there's so much on there. You could explore it forever. <laughs> uh, we had another question from Bruce who wants to know, has any work been done in the more shallow water of the Arctic Ocean? We have not been to the Arctic Ocean. Um, Falkor is, uh, we did one expedition in the Southern Ocean and I think uh, it scarred our team, our crew for life <laughs> that we were done. Um, it's not uh, rated as an icebreaker Falkor. So we haven't been able to do really um, high and low latitudes, but uh, the new vessel will have uh, some summer ice uh, capability. So we might be able to expand a little bit further our work. Okay, here's one from a bird enthusiast in the audience. Do you have anyone censusing birds during your cruises? Well, um, I don't know if you, when I just clicked on the cruises, you can see we just did uh, in January an expedition called Seabirds to Sea Floor, which was characterizing seabirds that we found in Australia's region on that particular expedition. So the answer is not every expedition has that, but we definitely have had some. And Aaron wants to know, do you see many whales? We do. Um, we've only had uh, two dedicated expeditions in five years for whales. But um, just like Dr. Rob Beeman says, he stops for Nautilus. We also stop for whales. <laughs> Excellent. I had a question that I might have got skipped over. Um, what uh, illuminant or light source do you use to get those images? Is it just regular visible light or ultraviolet or infrared or what? Um, great question. I don't have the exact answer for you, um, but I'm going to share a link with you about ROV Sebastian that has the list of its specifications. And on there will be all the information about the lighting on Sebastian. I just put it into the uh, chat here. Oh, I don't know if actually I have the... Let's see if I can do it to everybody. Um, there we go. There's a link there in the chat um, with all the specifications. We have a lot of lights. I think uh, I would say they're regular lights, but I don't want to speak out of turn. So our engineers would best be able to tell you. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. So I will put in a plug for our next expedition, which I just mentioned was the Phoenix Islands Protected Area. 
Um, and definitely encourage everybody to follow us along in June. Um, that will be an amazing expedition. We will be doing some live events as well, some live connections to the ships, especially for World Ocean Day. We'll be doing a live connection with Guy Harvey Ocean Foundation and students around the world. Um, we will be doing another event with uh, Sustainable Ocean Alliance and we'll make all of that available on our social media. And um, after that expedition, we will be heading to San Diego and doing some work in the California borderlands. So for those of you interested in sort of um, part of those seafloor mining issues, that area we're going to is a hot spot for that. Um, people are looking at it and we're gonna be there to do some uh, deep sea characterization with ROV Sebastian and Dr. Lisa Levin from Scripps Oceanographic Institute. Um, and so those are the next two expeditions that we'll have coming up on the horizon. Excellent. Definitely worth staying tuned to those. Um, well, I'll just invite if anyone else has questions that we haven't got answered yet, um, feel free to either drop them in the chat or unmute yourself and ask them. Um, I think we've got Carly for a couple more minutes here. Uh, Lita Beth wanted to know uh, what types of mining are people wanting to do in the California borderlands? So I don't think there's any specific plans for that area or region. Um, there are just uh, certain hot spots that um, right now is coming up. People are interested in rare earth mineral mining. And a lot of the deep sea has seamounts um, and vent areas that have uh, nodules, uh, manganese nodules, or have rare earth minerals that they are looking to um, access. And that's, um, to be honest, it's not my area of expertise. So I, I don't want to say too much about it. But um, except that it's important to understand what the biodiversity and system is um, to better evaluate what we need to do on our seafloor. Great. Anyone else have questions that you want to get in before we wrap up? Feel free to speak up. Well, my contact information is on the website, um, so schmidtocean.org, um, and I'm happy to address any questions or um, if there's interest in connections to the ship, we can make that happen with classrooms. And um, thank you again, everybody, for your support and encourage uh, you to follow along as we continue on our expeditions. Thank you so much, Carly. This was so fun. Um, you really definitely brought out the joy that everybody involved in these projects seems to feel around them and shared that with us. So we appreciate you taking the time. Um, I'll stop the recording here.